Uh, of course, the government has tried this sort of thing before, and it never works. Here in New York, they attempted to regulate sugary sodas in an effort to make us all healthier and to make the people with the diabetes, you know, the sugars, uh, really beat them into submission. Then they started forcing restaurants to show calorie counts. So what is to stop them from forcing you to exercise and eat better in the name of public health? Let's meet tonight's man panel and solve every problem in the world. We've got townhall.com political editor and host of The Guy Benson Show on Fox News Radio. It is Guy Benson. I love his new haircut. Very handsome. And we've got former aide to Senator Chuck Schumer. He is host of the Aggressive Progressive Podcast. He is Christopher Hahn and director of the Libertarian Institute.org. It is uh, Scott Horton. He looks way too happy to be Scott Horton, but he's here and he's Hi. smiling thus far. Hi, everyone. Great to have you. Um, so, Guy, there has been a massive hey. shift just in the last 10 days in terms of messaging from this administration about COVID. And, you know, not too long ago, we went from this is a pandemic of the unvaccinated to, well, you know, we got to live with it somehow. We got to do it. And uh, the admission that comorbidities really are the driving force here. What do you see happening next? Well, I think they did this because of political reality. They have to admit the truth now. The previous talking points aren't resonating. They don't make sense with people. Now, for their own political benefit, it can finally be said that there's a difference between going to the hospital and happening to test positive versus going to the hospital because you were very sick due to COVID, right? We've been talking about this for a year and a half, mm. and now the powers that be have deigned to allow us to talk about it as members of polite society. I find that very interesting. The other thing that you said in the opening mono that I found very interesting as well, I think it's true, is that this administration has focused too much on vaccines. And I'm pro-vaccine. I've been preaching, go get your vaccination on my radio show. And every chance I get, I am fully vaccinated. I encourage everyone in my life to do it. It's the right thing to do, in my opinion, and based on what the doctors have told me as well. But there's a difference between being pro-vax or anti-vax and only vax. Mm. And I think part of the problem that we've seen from this administration is look at our testing shortage right now. They reportedly rejected a big ramp up in testing because they were too focused on just vaccines. We didn't see an operation warp speed on therapeutics, for example, that worked very well against COVID because they were like this, this myopic obsession that they had on vaccines only. I think that approach was single-minded. It was defensible to a certain extent, but now I think we're seeing uh, the foolishness of that approach from the Biden administration and they are getting burned by that approach politically. Yeah, and people who are unvaccinated, Chris, they could still have gone to the hospital and gotten monoclonal antibodies or some of the drugs that were withheld from the market for months and months. Uh, those were also very successful in keeping people alive. So, you know, I don't know when the pandemic comes to an end, but I see the power grab as pretty endless. Your thoughts? Well, I'm hoping the pandemic comes to an end and we can all relax and move on with our lives. And I hope that people who are very concerned about this pandemic will accept it when it actually ends. And that is a big concern of mine right now, knowing a lot of people who are extremely yep. cautious during this whole process right now, even people who have been double or triple vaccinated. So we got to get to a point. Uh, I agree. Comorbi comorbidities are a huge problem. They're a huge problem before the pandemic. We have to make sure that our society is eating healthy and getting in shape. You and I agree on that fully. Sure yep. and, uh, and, and we have to, we have to you know, encourage people to do that. Yes. Uh, but look, I, I do believe that we have to have a market solution to some of these things, including vaccinations. I think insurance companies have to say, if you're vaccinated, your rate's X. If you're unvaccinated, your rate's Y. If you weigh X, here's your rate. If you weigh Y, here's your, here's your rate. Mm -hmm. And I think that market solution will drive a lot of people to get vaccinated and a lot of people to lose weight. They, they tried to do that, and they were called uh, racist. So is it realistic that we go, I mean, just, just listening to... Chris, there are a lot of people who feel the way he does, that, you know, society would be healthier if we could just make people lose weight, if we could make people exercise, and if they would g engage in healthier choices. And, you know, now we're on the slip, sl slippery slope, rather, where the federal government has already mandated the vaccine. So why would they stop there, Scott? Yeah. Well, and of course, they spent the last two years telling everybody, stay home, stay on your couch, and don't go out and get sunshine and exercise and get fit. When we've known from very early in this thing, at least 
the spring of 2020, maybe early summer 2020, that uh, this uh, disease hits, obviously, the elderly and the obese hardest. Um, and, you know, the previous administration, uh, back before uh, Trump in the Obama years, that's all they did was lecture people about eating right. Why couldn't they have just started uh, that back up again? But they didn't. Um, and and they, didn't, they did emphasize vaccines above any other kind of treatment or uh, preventative action, which is really a shame. But, you know, with Omicron, apparently, uh, from what I'm reading, it's really not infecting the lungs as much, and no. it's much less deadly, and it's more transmissible and less virulent. So this is what we're hoping for, like the Andromeda strain, right, that eventually it'll evolve to be less dangerous of a germ. And I talked with an epidemiologist a couple years ago who said this is exactly what's going to happen. It'll be like the Hong Kong flu, H2N2, yeah. from 1967 and 68, where eventually it just became another seasonal flu. And this will be too. But then the question is, how do we get all these bureaucrats to rel relinquish the power that they have seized in the name of the emergency? One, if this germ was gone, they'd be yeah. looking for another one, right? Just like the Pentagon looking they'd for looking another for war something. to fight. Yeah, that, and that is, that is a great right, comparison. That's... Uh, you're you're absolutely true. right. Yes, it is absolutely a thousand percent true because, you know, what has come with all of this authority? Trillions of dollars in spending. Where does that go? That goes to various bureaucracies who become addicted to those budgets. In government, how do you hold on to your budget? You spend what you've already got to justify getting more. So they're going to spend more. That means they're going to take more power because there is a direct correlation between how much the government spends and how much control they have over your life. Well, speaking of fatties and excess poundage, dog torture, Dr. Fauci is weighing us all down. But liberty-loving Senator Rand Paul is, it seems, the only person holding him accountable. Today, House Republicans released email excerpts that apparently reveal the top doc knew he was well informed that COVID probably came from a lab. Senator Paul followed up with Fauci on that. All right, cue the fireworks, boys. For most you of the scientists do. that came to you privately, did they come to you privately and say, no way this came from the lab? Or was their initial impression, Dr. Gary and Dr. others that were involved, was their initial impression actually that it looked very suspicious for a virus you know, that came from a lab? Senator, we are here at a committee to look at a, a virus now that has killed almost 900,000 people. And the purpose of the committee was to try and get things out, how we can help to get the American public. And you keep coming back to personal attacks on me that have absolutely no relevance to reality. That's actually not a personal attack. That's a very, very important question. He was informed about the probability that this virus was engineered and then leaked, probably accidentally, from that lab in Wuhan, China, that was partly funded by his agency. That's not a personal attack at all. Uh, that's actually called science. So what is Fauci hiding? Uh, I will start with you, Guy. I feel like Fauci was about two seconds away from insisting that Rand Paul really just wanted to date him. That was the vibe I was getting there <laughs> from Dr. Fauci, right, a la AOC. Similar thing. Uh, I don't think this is an impressive performance at all by Fauci. The origins of this virus has killed millions of people around the world matters a lot. His talking around it and hair splitting and sort of parsing is very suspicious. He's clearly angry that Paul goes after this line of questioning, but that's Paul's prerogative as an elected senator, and it's his job as a public servant to answer the questions that are posed of him. Also, there was an incident today where Fauci was caught on an open mic just grousing and grumbling, where he called another Republican senator, a doctor, by the way, a pro-vaccine doctor from Kansas, Roger Marshall, a moron, that he used an expletive. Oh. He needs to do a lot better. I've sort of given up on Fauci. I was never that negative on him, but I've grown more and more so over the months. <laughs> Doctor, you have a job that you say is to help people, and sparring and getting personal and acting like a partisan actor and using actual personal attacks like moron against a, a senator, that is a really bad look, and it's another example, I think, of why this man has squandered so much credibility. And by the way, he's not the only infectious disease doctor in the country. He's just been doing it for a very, very right. long time. He may have worn out 
his welcome, Chris, and, and what he's engaging here in here is, is what the young people call gaslighting. Chris Hahn. I think uh, what he's engaging in is as he's given his last you-know-what, and Rand Paul is one of the guys who gets under his nerves the most. And Good. clearly, Rand Paul is grandstanding for a bigger audience so that he can maybe run for president. So he's raising money by attacking Fauci. Look, it's not just Rand Paul. Most of the Senate is constantly running for president, not doing their job, grandstanding no, is, on every issue, and not doing moving his job. this country no, forward. He, he's he literally, literally trying to get to the... on an issue he knows nothing about. Okay, first of and all, he is truly just misleading he's America. He's a medical doctor that knows how to he read. He is an eye doctor who he worked is still at a mall. Medical doctor who went to medical school <laughs> eye and knows how. It is doesn't this matter. Is this hey, better? man, if if <laughs> if he were a proctologist, he would still have gone to medical he's school. Not, he, he, and he's he would. Not, did he go to he medical is, school he, or not? <laughs> He, he went did. to optometry school. He, he went is to not on the same school. level as Dr. Fauci. He does not know there how to deal with infectious disease. There are a lot of people who are not at the same he level as Dr. Fauci doctor. who know how to read he worked medical at a Walmart literature. In okay. Kentucky. Give me a break. Chris, <laughs> I'm not going to give you a break because you're full of hot wind. The point is we well, have I mean, to we're get compare to the him to Dr. Fauci of really? COVID. No, he is the United States senator that has evidence right. that the guy who's in charge of defeating the virus knew more about the origin of the virus than he is letting on. And as soon as he's pressed about that, he claims it is a I, personal I, attack. It is literally his job uh, to ask those questions. I am done with you. Uh, Scott Horton, you may now chime in. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Well, look, we know that Fauci was the one who approved the gain-of-function research at the Wuhan lab, despite Obama's oh previous God. ban. He, did, he had found that there was an emergency that required it. Yes. And so we don't know for sure whether that gain-of-function research led directly to this, but we do know that it very well could have, and we know, and what they were discussing today was a whistleblower essentially saying that he knew and could testify to the fact that Fauci had been briefed in January two years ago that this was a very real possibility and then he had come right out very soon after that completely dismissing the yeah. possibility as totally crazy talk. The reality here is this is the world's record for conflict of interest here. Amen. Why should Anthony Fauci even have a job where he would be in charge of deciding or pronouncing what's true or what's not about the origin of this virus when he had to, under questioning from Rand Paul, he had to add a new caveat. Well, we weren't funding research that was gain of function of concern. Oh, only the kind you should not be concerned about, yeah. except why would they be doing gain of function Let's on viruses everything. that aren't concerning? <laughs> The whole uh, thing is a joke. And the fact that he's even still in a government position right now at all is astounding. And you have to ask yourself, how much has Anthony Fauci's decision making affected your life? Uh, if it's more than just a little, then yes, his actions require questioning and they demand answers. And I'm glad someone like Rand Paul is doing that. All right, the man panel is going to stick around because I told them so, and I'm a dominatrix. Is the U.S. a more liberal or conservative nation? Hmm. A new NYU study claims America is becoming more liberal with every generation, which would explain why all the eight-year-olds I know are pretty much commies. Over the last 50 years, Americans' views on social issues like gay marriage have evolved the most, but that apparently isn't translating at the ballot box. Despite the liberal shift, voter registration is leaning slightly Republican, and the conservative views on things like abortion and gun rights, well, they haven't changed. Uh, so what is driving the trends, and can we really coexist peacefully? What will it do to our national politics? The man panel is back, Guy Benson, Chris Hahn, and Scott Horton. Uh, Guy, I will start with you. I think 30 years ago, you might have had a hard time with the Republican Party. Oh, yeah. I mean, obviously, things are changing slowly in the GOP on gay rights and other things. But, yeah, look, I think society has moved in a more left libertarian direction on social and sexual mores. There's no question about that. As you point out, the same study notes that on other big issues, taxes, guns, abortion, there hasn't been a significant shift in public opinion. So even though the society might be moving or drifting in one direction, on a certain set of sort of issues and, and cultural 
uh, sort of mores or norms, mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that people are going to start flocking to the Democratic Party, especially when the, Demo uh, when the Democratic Party is so consistently off-putting and supercilious and obnoxious. Uh, they are on sort of their own worst enemy in a lot of cases, and people don't like them, which is why, despite having the media on their side, they still manage to lose a lot of elections. That's racist and sexist to even say that, because we know you're not talking about the Democrat Party. We know you're talking about Kamala Harris. And your thinly veiled insults, they're not welcome here, guy. Um, all right, so, Chris Hahn, I think people are basically turning into libertarians. At some point, I hope they admit it and start voting like one. Look, I mean, I think most people are, they want more freedom in their life. I agree with you, especially mm. when it comes to how they live their personal life with who they love, where they work, how they marry, how they uh, worship. So, yeah, I agree with you 100 percent. Democrats do have a problem uh, expanding their base and messaging uh, as of late. So they have to get that together, and they will. They were fortunate for the last four years to have a bogeyman to attack that got people out to vote Democratic. They won't have that much longer. So they've got to come to terms with who they are and how they uh, appeal to people across uh, a broad spectrum of the population who, who tend to be more liberal on things that Republicans don't tend to focus on too much anymore, even though in some states in this country they are very harsh in the way they treat uh, uh, people of color and gays. Hmm. All right. Uh, so, Scott, how have Democrats blown it? Because that doesn't necessarily mean that Republicans will get it right. But, you know, Chris points out the reaction to the virus and the fixation on Trump. I don't think that's enough to keep voters around. Yeah, well, and here's the thing. I mean, I remember just uh, when Trump uh, lost the election, but um, it was very close, and his numbers went way up among blacks and Hispanics, and all the TV pundits said, what a mystery, after they demonized him as a white supremacist for four years. But the answer is obvious. It's a reaction to the lockdowns. And I'm predicting a massive shift to the, if not to the right, certainly to the Republican Party in the coming midterms over the lockdowns. The power grabs in the name of the emergency by especially the Democrats, but um, the, the Republicans too, but especially the Democrats, and they've worn it. They've identified themselves as the party of total control in the name of somehow destroying, abolishing this germ, COVID zero, the absolute impossibility. Yeah. And people are being tired and told they're not essential, that they don't have the right to go to work, that they don't have the right to freely associate with their own people. They see the Democrat politicians breaking their own rules and lockdowns constantly and this kind of thing. And so... <laughs> no lockdowns. But I would say that the GOP could still blow it because, um, of course, you know, the uh, GOP chair... Uh, who's Mitt Romney's niece, she, her entire narrative is that Biden is weak on foreign policy and we need real warmongers back in there. Oh God. So if the Republican Party does not want to embrace an America first foreign policy and they want to go back to a Mitt Romney double Guantanamo foreign policy, they could lose this incredible advantage that they now have. Yeah, no, they've, they've squandered it in the past. There's no doubt about that. I think uh, both parties are in their own identity crises. Uh, but you're absolutely right. And, you know, teachers in Chicago essentially declaring themselves non-essential workers and, you know, shutting down schools in Chicago for four days. You think that parents aren't sick of that crap? Uh, just wait. It is just the beginning. And they don't have an answer on that. They don't have an answer on the virus. They don't have an answer on inflation. Uh, but, you know, leave it to Republicans to blow a great opportunity. Uh, all right. Is there a way to fight aging? And to live forever, the answer could be yes. Scientists are testing different types of drugs to slow down aging processes, increasing the average lifespan. Although a magic pill that could boost life expectancy from 77 years to 150, not likely anytime soon, researchers say. A 10 to 20% increase in lifespan is conceivable. But do you want to live to be 150, Guy? Do I get to grow old with you and Dreamboat together? Yes. Because that sounds appealing. Yes. How what doesn't trouble. sound appealing? This you. is what I'm trying to figure out. <laughs> true. Fact check. True. Would this be that it would these drugs would extend your life mm -hmm. in old age, so you would still age at the same rate, would become an old person, then would live much longer as an old person? Yes. That's a question on quality of life. Like, mm. do you want to be 100 and 
40, mm -hmm. or does the whole process of aging over, let's say, 80 years extend to 150? Because that's more that's appealing they're trying, to That's what they're, they're trying right. to uh, marry together, and they call it the health span as opposed to the lifespan. The amount of time uh, that you have vibrancy mm. and physicality and cognitive function, that's what they're also at the same time trying to increase. Because, you know, it's like no one wants to have like their eyes glued shut and be like, meh, meh, mashed potatoes when they're 150, <laughs> but everyone wants to be like, I'm a walking boner. <laughs> right, Chris? <laughs> Exactly. I want to be a walking boner when I'm 140 right. years old. Right. I'm sure that'll be very appealing to a lot of people in America. I look. I, I don't. I, I, I would love to live a long life, like Guy said, if we could just be healthy the entire time and we could still run and, and exercise and play golf and have fun and go skiing. Great. But if I'm sitting in a chair watching Netflix, I would imagine by the time I'm 140, I'll get through my entire queue. So I don't know what I'm going to do. Well, if the Democrat Party is still in power, don't worry. They will have cannibalized you uh, in the reign of terror. And you're going to be in a very dark room with no Netflix oh. at all. Sorry, buddy. Uh, so, Scott, what about you? Do you want to live to be a 1,000? <laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, really, I want to go back to 27. If somebody could swing that, give me a pill, or at least yeah, just make my hair grow back. I'm sure they're going to do all sorts of things. That's what's so exciting because, you know, look at the, uh, the Democrat leaders in Congress. They have a combined age of like 750. Uh, so <laughs> if, if they stay in power, they're going to figure out a way. You know, they're going to have like blood boys and anti-aging pills and human growth hormone and, you know, God, whatever, again, you know, bring them up again, but whatever Jeff Bezos is doing, uh, we're all going to get it. But, of course, the communists are going to be like, but poor people have to have it too. I'm so caring. You know, uh, yeah, go ahead, guy. Go think ahead. about how many wars Scott could oppose over a thousand years. That's true. Think if Scott could get a time machine and oppose the dumb wars in the past. All the technology is there. I mean, the it would aliens suck gave if it, it was to just us. one long war, right? It would really suck. Uh, it, it, what Afghanistan? Well, if people would just you would listen, and we could stay out of the wars <laughs> in the first place. Well, you know. Listen to Scott. Me too. Listen to Scott about that. And Enough already. His hair and about all the other libertarian stuff that he they, says. Collectively. Look, they, they can't even cure baldness. They ain't going to make us live forever. They That's just not going to happen. You know what they're going to do, and it's cruel? <laughs> they're going to cure everyone else's baldness but yours. <laughs> That's why you can't have <laughs> Thanks, <missing>. Kennedy. <laughs> Guy, Chris, and Scott, excellent Truth man is. panel. Thank you all. You're great.